welcome to the seventh of our webinar series. Um, I'm speaking to you blind from Br Br sunny Brisbane. And um, today we do have a special guest with us, Stu Robertson, who is live from Auckland in New Zealand. And Stu has a very interesting presentation to show us today, which I, I, he showed me a bit of it earlier. And uh, there's a lot of images that I haven't seen before. Um, now, Stu, of course, is probably best known for his piece in 10,000 Hands project, uh, which some of you may have read about or seen him present about. But obviously, there's a lot more to Stu's work than that. So whilst I go and click some buttons and have a little bit of a panic attack in the back here, I'm going to turn this over to Stu, uh, who is going to uh, dazzle you with some amazing imagery. And uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll be back uh, visible soon. So Stu, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and then share your screen and take it away? Thanks, Nick. I have to say, Nick and I have done a few things before, and this is the this is the first ever time that um, something he's ever tried to pull off technically um, hasn't worked. Uh, thank you all very much for joining today. So, um, just before I kick into it, I was asked to do this talk, and I, I I'm doing something that I haven't done before. So I speak at a lot of conferences. Um, I do a bit of things, a bit of stuff for Leica as well. Um, I do have a passion for photography. And a lot of people know the Peace in 10,000 Hands project through Leica or my social channels and things like that. Um, but my journey to photography took 40 years. So I'm sort of, whoa, there you are. We've, we've, got, <laughs> wrong camera. we've, got, you from, we've got you from the other angle, from the wrong camera. Yeah, it's the wrong camera, though. Mm. Yeah, keep going. I'll, I'm yeah. just, so if I flick on and off, it'll, I know it'll be annoying, but just uh, okay. bear with me. Go for it. Janelle might have a joke about that. But um, so <laughs> essentially, uh, this is a mix of my TEDx talk. It's a mix of some things that I've done for Leica before and a talk that I do for, um, uh, for conferences. I speak at a lot of conferences. And the talk that I do there is about the adjacent theory. So that is essentially bolting. Uh, the, you, can, you can look into the adjacent theory um, after this. You can Google it. But essentially my interpretation of the adjacent theory is it's a, it's a, a machination or a coagulation of everything you've done in your life to get you to exactly where you are right now. So if you have specific training in something, uh, in, in, in a specific moment, you can pull that in. So if you're you know, you're a mother, a doctor, um, a sister, and various other things, we've worked in various fields, all of that adds up to exactly who you are right now. And those skills and talents aren't always pulled in to, um, to sort of tease out the best of who we are in, in any moment. And so, you know, I, I have I've started companies, they've all been in creative land, I've uh, been a professional pickpocket, worked on cruise ships, uh, I give, uh, as, as Ryan is probably cringing, tell them you were professional and, they gave, and you gave everything back, yes I gave everything back, uh, stand-up comedy, magic and various other things, so all of the, including truck driver and all this kind of stuff, so I've done a lot of my life and I've really had to pull all of that to give me the strength to do my photographic project. Um, so I will, I'll, I'll go into that, some of that now for you, but that's just to kind of encapsulate this situation. So we're going to share screen. Here we go. Share. So, hello. So this is, um, this is the, this is the project that I um, have started. And my TED talk is essentially about the most powerful thing in the world is not a woman, a man, a country, or a bomb. The most powerful thing in the world is an idea. So that's essentially, I believe we have you now, Nick. Hello. That is essentially um, what the TEDx talk was about based on the idea of peace in 10,000 hands. But it took me many years to get to that point. So I have a passion for photography. My grandfather uh, was a Leica photographer and had a collection. I had one of his cameras. I, I didn't have a camera when I was a child, and I, and I didn't do photography. Um, and about 10 years ago, I bought a Leica Deluxe. I was traveling and just took snaps as I traveled. That's the Eiffel Tower. So as, I'm just going to scroll through these images. I've just put a whole collection of stuff together. But as you look at these images, um, it may or may not be apparent to you that I photograph or used to photograph the world with no people in it. Um, that's, my, that's my happy place. That's my comfortable spot. Um, although I, I sort of may seem extroverted at times, I can do that, but I'm, I'm um, a hard out introvert, essentially, and uh, that my, I'm more comfortable being alone, certainly not um, standing in front of someone taking their, um, taking their photograph. So as I travel, I took these images, 
but I started to think, why am I doing it? What's the purpose of this? But I've, it was absolutely and utterly prolific. So that don't think, just shoot. So I never really thought about what I was doing. Uh, I'm not trained in photography. I'm not a professional photographer. I don't take commissions or anything like that. So I sort of, if you can imagine that there might be a set of rules to photography, I sort of went around just testing the water and, and breaking them. I was very uncomfortable with manual settings in the camera, so I just shot everything on auto. All of the images you've seen are uncropped and unedited straight from the Deluxe. I love square, so I'd shoot square, uh, and there was a black and white film grain shot, uh, opportunity for taking a shot. So this is basically what I did, um, and it was cool and people liked it, but it, it wasn't really taking me anywhere. So the next step for me was to start to introduce other things. So I, I love lines and I love, as you've probably seen up till now, black and white, so proper black and white contrast to me in an image is, is, um, is not everything, but it's really important if you can to leave an area of mystery. You'll notice all these photos have lines in them. And the black parts of the images that I take are really let the viewer fill those spaces in. So then I essentially decided I would have a group of parameters that I would look at. So um, lines, crosses, this is a cross here, and then start to try to look at things slightly differently. I extend it to stairs, so everywhere I travel I take photographs of stairs. These are at the Tate Modern, this is in uh, Switzerland. Little girl climbing a set of stairs and, and dense patterning. One of the things I do is I always look at each of the four corners before I take a photograph. And one of the things I love doing is filling the entire frame with a subject um, as much as possible. And that sort of, for me, that's about perspective, it's about the verticals being vertical, it's about patterns, angles, and all that kind of stuff. But you'll, you'll notice there's still really not really any people in what I'm photographing. Um, I love photographing art on walls as well. So then a couple of things started to happen. People sort of took note. All of these have been on the Deluxe, by the way. Um, this is uh, a shot through some trees. Again, I needed it straight from the camera. And people, this is uh, Yves Saint Laurent's garden in Marrakesh, in one of the ponds. And so I started to do a couple of things. For me, validation on, in photography is not having my work hang. Uh, and I realised that if you're a photographer, whether it's increasing your feed on Instagram or getting commissions or that's doing your next book, so different things are driving different people creatively. But essentially, I decided to I start to introduce people into what I was doing. This is a very stressful time for me, um, is to get someone. So this is a pre-people shot. This is a post-people shot. This is London and this is a Villa Beach. Uh, on the California coast, you know, so someone standing under the pier there, so it's a pretty good example of, of, of my initial change. And then as I went through, I started to introduce people, but sort of very, um, I felt safe at a distance, and you'll notice that a lot of these photographs are shot from behind people. I would practice my art on animals. <laughs> yeah, these two horses had a rather amorous view of the uh, fake unicorn. Moving on two pigeons in Santa Barbara. So I started to photograph um, either parts of people or people from behind. Uh, I didn't really realize what I was doing, but it made me really, really comfortable, slightly stalkery, possibly. Um, so I followed this lady into, uh, into a cathedral in Europe, and she sat there. I actually went and spoke to her after her every day to uh, commemorate her husband that had passed away. So stories started to come through the images that I was, that I was taking. This is Soho in London. You can see I'm, it's people are either sleeping or I'm behind them, that kind of stuff. So, but it really sort of opened me up uh, with the passing shot to um, to the possibility of actually photographing people and engaging with them. I find looking through the eyepiece into into someone else's eyes often like looking um, into their soul. So then I started to be a little bit bolder about what I would do, where I actually stand in front of someone from a distance and take their photograph. I do love this one. Um, and I've, I've put this one in here because, and we're still on the deluxe at the moment, me just jamming around doing my thing. Um, but I have a friend who's starting a, a, a restaurant and wanted a, a couple of images. So you can see the scale of this. That's him standing in front of the restaurant. They wanted to black the windows out. So that's a, a deluxe file blowing up to probably one of the largest or larger prints of, of a deluxe. Um, but anyway, it's kind of fun, straight from the camera, uh, no editing or anything like that. So then. I started to get a little bit closer to people and sort of insert myself 
into situations where um, I was I would either see something going on or I'd be picking up on on lighting. I love the graphicness again, the blacks and the whites. Still has a very street kind of feel to it. Um, this was a guy that was uh, breaking up with his girlfriend in a in a bar in Beijing, and that was the moment she turned around and walked away from him for the final time. So this sort of got my comfort level up in terms of really moving up on people. And then I took it to another level. I decided to um, ask people if I could take their photograph. Um, and I would, uh, to sort of test the boundaries of that, I would pick people that I didn't know. So all of these are, again, raw and just people that I hadn't ever met before. This is a woman I met in a park in, in Wellington. And then that kind of gave me the idea, um, if I wanted to do something with my photography, um, I wanted it to be philanthropic, I wanted it to be global, I wanted it to create change, and about 10 years ago had uh, the idea of peace in 10,000 hands, essentially the white rose is an ancient symbol of peace. All nations, religions, languages understand the meaning of the white rose. So I uh, purchased a Leica S, um, I had a monochrome and I headed off to New York. So you can see an immediate style change as I grapple <laughs> with a rangefinder camera. And uh, I, I took it upon myself to um, just take the cameras out of the box and head straight to New York with no, um, no instruction manuals. I wanted what to could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> they used to do the same thing. They used to do the same thing. Um, when I when I got magic, so I got the you know the classic sawn in half, and if, with a proper power tool, and you cut wood and carrots and everything up first, and then you cut some in half. The first time I did it was live on stage out of the box. I kind of the the, the pressure of, the pressure is what creates that creative explosion in me, where I need to solve things on the hop. So when I did stand up comedy, I would go onto the stage essentially without a routine, and have to fight my way through the show. Um, that's what sort of it's it's that. Friction, you know, without you don't have fire without friction. It's that pressure that, that creates a diamond. Um, so essentially, that's that's how I do things. So that's what I did. I went over there um, again, back into my happy place, photographing either people from behind or at a distance. These are all on the monochrome. This is the first person on the planet that was asked to hold the white rose. Um, so I'm in New York. I've got the light like, arrest. I photograph her from behind on the monochrome. Summon all the courage you could possibly imagine. A 14 year old has at a school dance. I went and introduced myself as Stu from New Zealand. The, the actual introduction didn't go too well. We're on Fifth Ave in New York. She looked at me like I was a complete and utter insane stalking idiot uh, and gruffly told me no and, uh, and, and walked off. Uh, I was shocked. So it took, it took me a, a couple of days to get the gumption up. But in amongst all of this, uh, the storm of the century, Sandy Pitt, uh, and this is uh, downtown New York. This is the subway. This is... Um, there was no one in New York, 42nd Street, Times Square. The military moved in. The lights went out. Uh, the snow was coming the next week, so it was very cold. There was no hot water. There was no heating. You couldn't charge your cell phone. All the repeater towers were down. You couldn't call anybody. But through that, I took my first photograph. This was taken on Bleecker Street in New York, uh, and the woman had been helping her friend in an underground gallery in Chelsea, and her fingernails were very damaged from scooping around and the, the gallery was flooded, it was on a lower level. And she was very embarrassed about her fingers. At that point, you'll notice another thing. Uh, I don't photograph people's faces when I start, it's just their hands. So I convinced her uh, over a sandwich and a cold coffee uh, in Bleecker Street to let me take her photograph, that's called the hurricane. So my first trip to New York was, I still had to approach people. I was still working out, these were all taken on the S, um, how to actually do what I was doing in depth of field and what looked good and facing the light and back to light and this kind of stuff. And um, I got through, this is the building um, next to where I was staying. It was a pretty stressful time. I walked past this guy every day and he would collect newspapers from the rubbish bin and sell them for a dollar each. And it, it took me all my courage, he was in a wheelchair, to ask this guy if I could take his photograph. And it was a, a seminal moment for me because he said how honored that he was that I would choose him. So I had an inkling at that time that people would really appreciate having their photograph taken, which more often than not is actually, um, is actually the case. Me discovering lens flare. So from New York, I took off to India. I had the, I had the, uh, the Deluxe, I had a monochrome, and I had the, the Lycaris with me. 
Um, and, you know, my happy place is, is doing this kind of photography, so I kind of got into that. This was a really good lesson for me. Uh, verbal language was an issue. People would still hold the rose because they, there seems to be this intrinsic understanding of what, what I'm doing for some reason, even when there's no chance of understanding the language. But I did have uh, an interpreter with me for a month. I hired a driver in a car and, um, and travelled around. Uh, this is the taxi driver that drove me from the airport on the MCROM. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk to each of these images. I've included a lot of images, just so people can kind of, you can kind of have a look and, and see what's going on. You might have some questions, you can follow up after or something like that. This is uh, Mata Ganga, or the Ganges at, at Rishikesh at sunset. And then from there I went into Dalwara with a, a great sense of uh, vim, vigour and, and confidence. And it was really uh, an important part of the journey in Peace in 10,000 Hands in terms of not having anyone say no and people being really, really interested genuinely in this, you know, um, Kiwi person walking around a village. It was a small village and um, spent a bit of time in there and got to know a few people. And if you, if you compare these, especially you can see there's a face in there. Um, but you can see that there's a, a style change that's starting to happen in terms of what I'm doing. Um, letting go of the, the monochrome, which I still my favorite camera, and, and focusing more on, on the S and creating these images with a, a, a sort of really with a sense of poetry. Um, the project does give you uh, challenging times, and, and often I look through um, through the viewfinder of the camera with a, with a tear in my eye, bring that up the stairs. Um, but India was rich pickings for me. Uh, I love this image. I'm not sure if you can see sort of in the bottom left-hand uh, quadrant of the image. There's a fly um, in mid-flight uh, as well as one on her foot. I, this woman, I was attracted to taking her image because of the bright coloured fabrics and, and it was just a, a rug on her lap and um, the blue fabric fell away to reveal a, a newborn baby. Um, it was a shocking moment. It's one of my favourite images. At the beginning of the project, I would still spend a lot of time taking photographs of my environment and recording what was going on as I was moving from portrait to portrait. But that, for me, became quite a burden in terms of um, following my style and looking at everything. Um, and when I've spoken at, at Leica Academies and different things before, I'm all about experimentation and I'm all about doing absolutely everything and breaking the rules and you know put your camera on auto it's totally fine there's there's no extra medals for being in a manual if you want to have a play around a manual if you love shooting a manual that's great but there's sort of no judgment to it um, and then so through this um, people started to ask me why peace so why peace is uh, I do this for a couple of reasons it's for the next generation and the project really is about making the invisible visible. And apart from the youth that are going to inherit uh, everything that we are currently doing to the world, there are vast numbers of people on the planet who don't have a voice. And that's about making the invisible visible. So when people ask me why am I doing it, aside from raising the $100 million and, and the other things that will come out of it, um, that's, that really is the main reason. So one of the things I love, every time I'm sort of kneeling down in front of someone with a big camera pointing at them, I'm trying to create a piece of art. And, and you'll notice that the, I'm, I'm actually photographing a rose. I'm not photographing a person. And so when you look at these, you see blurry people. Um, and so a lot of people are like, you're taking portraits of people that are blurry. And this, the whole, you know, um, don't think, just shoot. There are absolutely no rules. Um, you know, there's, um, there was a time when I was in... Um, South Africa, there's a whole lot of people lined up in Cape Town taking, it was the most incredible sunset. And I had slowed the shutter speed down to about a 15th or something like that and was shooting in black and white and was moving the camera. So there was this sort of swirly beautifulness and uh, everyone was sort of showing each other their photographs of this amazing sunset. And I, I showed them my blurry black and white picture. They were quite disgusted. But, you know, the, the thing is you have to be true to your own creative passion. And if you want to stick things on your photographs or if you want to rip them up, draw on them, put people that aren't in the photographs or remove them, all of that stuff is fine as, as long as you're following your true passion. Um, and for me, the, the pivot point of this really is all about the photography. 
Um, California has been fantastic for the project. Um, this is a woman I sat next to on an aeroplane and the tattoo that you can see behind her is her daughter Margay that was uh, killed by a distracted driver in America. Um, and so every one of these has a story, which I, I won't go into now, but um, I essentially get connected and meet a lot of people and people ask me, how do you take photographs of, of people? Who do you choose? And essentially a lot of it is happenstance. It's who I'm sitting next to, who I get introduced to, and then other people are targeted like Ringo Starr and the Dalai Lama. Um, this is a place called Death Alley or Murder Alley. All those red crosses you see are, are deaths just by handguns. And this is uh, the, Mon the Monton uh, Manchester, uh, the corner of. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's not a, a white area um, of, of LA. It's, it is a dangerous area. And so I would go there and photograph and walk up and down that street three times. Um, and then uh, I won't do that anymore. But uh, it was, you know, <laughs> the thing is that I think if, it, if it's an honest, if you're being true and honest, as a chef, for instance, you will try um, prawns dipped in uh, egg and with breakfast cereal. You will experiment. And, and the thing is you need to put yourself, I think, um, if you truly want to test your creative ability or talent into situations that are very challenging, because if you avoid those, you actually don't understand the bandwidth that you have as a creative to, to take photographs. Um, you know, I love this image, the, the message on his, his hands, I'm not sure if it should be blurred out or not, but um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an unusual situation. And when taking a portrait of something, of someone you wouldn't necessarily say, put your fists towards the camera. And it really is, um, it really is about experimentation. Um, and I think um, for me, I've learned more about um, photography by doing other things than I have by doing photography and bringing those things to this art. These are some of the, I've put in some of the icons that um, I've met along the way. And all of these people um, come through the power of the idea. So they don't want to meet me, they don't want to meet Sue Robertson, they don't care about what I'm doing or anything like that. This is all about the power of my idea. Um, and so if you can, generate an idea with your photography uh, or whatever your creative passion is, it puts you into uh, incredible, incredible situations. The power of an idea is really when other people start to share your idea with you. Um, this was uh, at a party, this is Mickey Raw. you can see a tattoo on his finger, it's the, the tattoo of his um, brother's name, Joe, so he wanted his brother to be in the portrait as well. You'll notice, well, you may or may not notice something about this, and it's not a test. The rose is actually blurry in this image, um, and it's one of the only ones I've ever taken like this. This is Hans Zimmer. He's an Academy Award winning composer and does Batman and a whole lot of um, uh, incredible films. And I was spent a bit of time with him in his studio, and he played um, with one hand, he played basically the ode to the white rose, which I recorded. It's a phenomenal piece of music, but he held essentially the rose in his left hand and, and channeled through his other hand. So in that moment, I, uh, I chose to, to change the, the uh, that's weird, Oli Yankovic. So I, cha I chose to change uh, where I was actually focusing um, the camera. This is Rose uh, Sherman and she, I said to her, what does peace mean to you? I ask everybody five questions, that's the last question. And, um, and she's 92 years old, lived in Hollywood her whole life. And she said, without peace, we've got effing nothing. And then just let out the most guttural laugh. And she was a great lady. This is Ringo Starr. Kiss. So in New Zealand, um, this is where it's all begun. It's where I want the home of the project to stay. And um, people sort of ask, how do you spread the 10,000 out? So based on population, New Zealand can only have four portraits uh, in, in the 10,000. That's, that's how we uh, work out across the world. So uh, there's obviously a few more uh, than four that will, come out of, that will come out of New Zealand. So this is uh, a story where I got connected with the Dalai Lama and through a, a series of fantastic um, good misfortunes and things happening, I ended up getting the portrait. Um, which is he passed, this is him passing the rose from his left to his right. And I actually didn't even realize he'd made eye contact with me. Um, I thought he was going to pose for the photo, uh, but he doesn't take portraits really anymore. And he certainly doesn't hold what's called a device. 
Um, so that was one of the, the luckier shots that I've got. And while I was, uh, I photographed him in San Francisco, I took other shots. So what's happened through photography for me is it's opened a significant um, number of doors uh, that I never would have been afforded or had the opportunity to do. And one of them was to make a film where I got to get, uh, light an airplane on fire <laughs> and get hold of a fireman to stand in front of it and do a, and do a slow-mo shot with the front guy holding the rose, which was great. Um, and then the film was projected onto the, the scale looks a bit kooky, but that building is, is absolutely huge. So this is the War Memorial Museum in Auckland, and uh, there's a 13-minute video uh, film that we filmed specifically for and used old footage for, and it's the first time um, outside of Anzac Day that that building um, has been allowed to be projected on. So I have a studio and a gallery. This, there is only half the image here. I'm not sure what happened, but I thought I'd put it in just to give you an, an idea of what it looks like from, from the outside. But essentially, this is the inside. So uh, this is a studio and a gallery set up in Queenstown, New Zealand. So if you're ever in Queenstown, um, make sure you drop me a line if you want to uh, check it out. And so I guess one of the things, if you want to be recognised in your creative craft, whatever that might be, um, whether it's patchwork or photography or you know whatever you one of the one of the ways of um, feeling validation is having your work hanging on someone's wall and someone's paid for it uh, and also having exhibitions and so again this is all based on the power of the idea so I don't really take any of this too personally uh, to be honest but the the exhibitions that have happened through the power of the project and the message have been great in my career um, for the last thirty years I've Started a few businesses, all, all being in creative areas of um, publishing, uh, event design, fabrication, fitting out shops for Vodafone, doing Heineken um, uh, brand activations and that kind of thing. So I've put um, that experience to creating artworks that aren't standard in their frame. And there's light boxes, there's multiple um, images, ACM on a CNC router and that kind of thing. So I present the images and what I hope is a, an approachable way. I really want uh, people to, I'm, I'm, I don't use too much glass. I like people being able to feel like they're in the image, they can relate to the image. These are dye bonded images. This is a, a work called The Exquisite Clarity of Standing Together. It's 85 people standing, looking out, holding the white rose. Um, I love neon, I'll come to neon in a minute. So why neon? So this is, you know, I guess if you're a photographer and you sell your images, if you're a photographer and you take portraits, you know, you know this, I've been told by a lot of art collectors to my face um, <laughs> that we don't collect um, photography. It's not in our collection. And these are people with significant collections, you know, museum-like level collections. And they have sculpture and they have a whole lot of other things. You know, they have, they have digital, they have video, but they don't have photography. And so I try to break the barrier down to make the photography accessible um, to people by kind of tricking people that the fact that it's a photograph, right? So this is a photograph with neon on it. So I get people with their fists um, tattooed. So this is an exact facsimile of the word stay true um, under, under, uh, under that neon. And so I, I choose messages that I like. Um, and obviously the neon is, is hand blown glass. And if you put argon or neon through it, you get um, different colours depending on the frosting and glass or if it's clear. But every time I do one of these, um, they essentially they sell out and they've proved very popular. And uh, one of the people who very proudly, I don't know why people who don't collect what you do proudly tell you they don't collect, it seems a bit mean, um, has bought one of these images. So we, <laughs> we now have, and it's happened on more than one occasion, so that feels great. But what this has also done um, is it's, it's, it's forced my creative interpretation of the project into, um, into other areas. So this is a replica uh, tank barrel. Um, this is the muzzle um, of the tank barrel. So that was created out of one square block, so a billet of aluminum or aluminium, depending on where you're from, and routed in one piece out of it um, from drawings that we took from a tank in the Second World War. I actually tried to get a tank barrel, and I was told the best place to get a, a tank 
is on the Syrian border and turn up with a gas axe and literally I was in touch with militaries around the world so I thought I'll just make my own. But the difference with this tank barrel is it's hand polished um, aluminium, aluminum, oh sorry, stainless steel, stainless steel. I've led you completely wrong. And down the side of it is engraved the meaning uh, of the word namaste. And I made three of these um, tank barrels, but they come with a very, very powerful, um, powerful message. And I make crystal weapons as well. So this is an exact replica to scale of a 45 millimeter Glock made out of lead crystal. And for those of you out there who are looking at it, you might have already worked out that this piece of work is called Green Peace. Because as we know, a handgun is called a piece. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a work that I uh, created called Infinite Love. So these sit within the photographic collection and almost give more um, power to the photographic message because it's across other areas. This is a Barbushka uh, in, um, in Russia and uh, Gorky Park's just back over to her left. Uh, but when I kneel uh, next to her, I'm, I'm slightly taller than, than she is. Uh, the bumpiness under this guy's uh, jumper is automatic weapons. Uh, and that's his name on his neck. I'll let you work out why he has his name on his neck. So Russia um, was fantastic. I always wondered how Gandhi would hold the rose. And I was in the park there and there was a sculpture of him. So I put the rose in, uh, in his hand. So Turkey, the reason this is here, there's actually a place called Batman. So you can see above my head, you can uh, Google where Batman is to try and sort of work out where I was going. Um, this was a difficult trip. Um, I spent quite some period of time there and I, I never really go into the specific difficulties, but it was uh, the Armenian, um, the Iranian, the Iraq, and then the Syrian border. It's sort of, if this is Turkey, Armenia, Iran, Iraq, and then Syria is this bit here. Um, but it was uh, a very, very interesting time. Um, in terms of the sitting within the human condition, it really, it did test me. There was, uh, you know, we, we all share similarities in the human condition, but we, all are, we also have had great differences, but underlying we have the same motivation. So um, if you can see the, the chat opposite me, uh, staring at the camera, I, I literally was a bit worried about this guy. I've been with gang members and deals in various situations and, and had been threatened and, and I always feel I'm going to be in a position to get out but this was we were staying with this guy we just turned up um, he had nine children uh, had a cow his wife made those big pieces of bread and they're huge in an underground oven um, you have tomato you have cucumber you have halva the apple juice you see on the table I bought um, all vegetarian and each village has a different kind of cheese if, if there's a cow and uh, sort of summoning up the courage to say to this guy, I want to photograph him. And as I was looking through the eyepiece into his eyes, he just had this woof look back at me uh, that made me feel not very safe. So I, I, I said to him, can you, I said to my, um, my, my handler, I said, can you please ask him to close his eyes, but just keep the same position. So he closed his eyes and it wasn't really working. And then I said um, to the, the, my handler, I said, can you please ask him to think what peace means to him? And he was a very hard guy. Um, and has a very manual job, and this this is this is what happened basically, and it was a profound moment for me uh, because you know if the eyes are to the soul, and when people are looking out, you, there's different lenses with which you look at things. He obviously felt judged when he was looking at me. And was obviously if he's got his eye on things, he, he can protect himself. He's a bit wary of uh, the, the the area I was in. I asked if there was any westerners in the area because I wanted to connect with them and find out what was going on. And a woman told me that they hadn't seen a Westerner for 25 years in this specific area. So this is something I've I picked up and I've carried through. So this is part of, now it's a project within the project, photographs of people with their eyes closed, asking them what peace means to them. So the reason I went to South Africa was Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I was invited over to photograph him holding the white rose. And then when I was there, <clears throat> I went to Cliptown, Cryfontaine, Lavender Hill, Soweto, various um, places like that, and would photograph people holding um, the white rose, the white roses in, uh, in his mouth. He, Ricky Gervais, Jamie Lee Curtis, and a few other people have uh, chosen to buck the trend and, and put it in their mouth. So South Africa was fantastic. Um, I, I posted a picture of this woman, we've already seen her. Um, her name is Kati, and she, this is a Khoi woman, uh, and until the 30s, you could 
uh, buy a license to hunt these people um, and you were paid based on body part that you brought back. Uh, it's absolutely and utterly barbaric thing to consider these days, but it shows you how you know recently that things like that have happened. They're pastoralist people uh, and extraordinarily gentle people. So um, I, I don't take lighting with me. I don't take a tripod with me. I don't take a reflector with me. I literally uh, just have the camera and the rose. Um, so that makes the photo shoots very quick. Uh, people that are the icons, uh, like Seal and that kind of thing, they really appreciate the fact there's no faffing around and all the rest of it. But I often find myself in situations where I um, have to really think on my feet in terms of how I'm going to get the shot that I need. One of the things I love doing, and I know that um, a lot of you will love doing this as well, is the patterns that you see from the sky. I love photographing out of airplane windows and helicopters and that kind of thing. This is actually coming into Haiti, and this is a place called City Soleil, 400,000 people living with no reticulated power, sewerage or water. Um, rape, murder, abduction and looting happen every day. There's no police presence. Um, it's the largest slum in the Northern Hemisphere and the, the poorest part of the Western Hemisphere is, is Haiti. So it's an extraordinarily dangerous place to go. Um, but uh, when you get in there um, and start talking to the people, as long as you don't loiter, it's, um, you, you get the shot. So one interesting thing in Haiti, most of the people I photographed had their hand on something, which was, uh, it was kind of, I had a whole collection of people there had their hands on things, but I thought I would, I would um, switch it out for a little bit and just get rid of some of this. This is actually a taxi. So one of the things I've always, this is my entourage in a Mexican prison. Um, I had a, a huge number of people. I have the habit of wandering off. I've had it since a child. Um, I just sort of like whoop, and I've apparently I vanished. So I had a, a guy with a, a big gun basically on my shoulder for the whole time, but I didn't have any issue there. But one of the photographs that I really wanted to take of someone who was in, incarcerated was not only to be in the cells with prisoners and talk to them and ask them what peace means to them to take these portraits, but was um, someone in a death row situation having their hands outside the bars um, holding the white rose. And then um, Antarctica. So Antarctica. <laughs> It's terrible. Antarctica is um, it's, it's a place I've always wanted to go. So my grandfather, Eric Payton, born in 1903, uh, the, Sir Edmund Hillary was a neighbour of the family. My grandfather came out on a wooden ship, and in the wooden ship was two Boeing 1s, and he was the last man alive to fly Boeing 1. This is all was put together by the family at a, a much later date. So he was an engineer. He loved Leica. He collected Leica. And his son... Um, Neil Payton went over to America, went to MIT, and this um, this little Leica here, you can see, um, he pulled out of the rubbish bin at MIT, um, and, and I ended up, I, I haven't inherited it, he's still alive, he gifted it to me. Uh, but one of the things that my grandfather talked about a lot was Antarctica and adventure and sailing ships, and he would smoke cigars and he would drink whiskey, and as he told me these stories. And so I had a complete and utter fascination and love affair with the only frozen continent on the planet, which is difficult to get to some parts um, and easier to get to other parts, no matter where you are. It is a profound place to be. So I've just put a little collection of images um, together here to show you. So. When you fly down, you go down on a C-130, an LC-130 is when um, the ice is not hard enough and they drop the skids down. So this is an LC-130 and you sit on cargo nets. It is the noisiest environment I've ever been in. You go past the point of no return, which is a red dot on the map, which means the plane can't turn back to New Zealand, uh, which is where the American military uh, uh, flights go from the Koreans and various other countries are all based out of Christchurch in New Zealand. And um, you sit on this thing and the, we had what's called a droop nose. So the front skid didn't go down. Um, we flew around burning our fuel for over an hour to land. But when you land, um, the Antarctica peels open through a variety of vehicles. One is a ski -doo. Uh You need to get your ski license. The other is helos. You, you chopper all over the place. This is called Ivan the Terror Bus. So this is what meets you when you land. Um, at Willie's Field, and you sit on this with a whole lot of other wide-eyed people, whether you've been there before or not, you're always excited to get back. And um, this bus actually drives past 
Scott base, so the New Zealand base, so that the, the Americans dropped the Kiwis off on the way. And this is called a Hanglin, and uh, this one's sunk. This is the Ross ice shelf, and uh, we uh, ground ourselves down to sea level. That's a little sidey shot of Scott base for you. When you land, the first thing you do is training. You've got to learn how to survive for four days by yourself. Um, and there's only ice and rock, so you've got to know how to light a fire and all the things that you get. And this was the first portrait that I took uh, for Peace in 10,000 Hands on Antarctica. It's the um, taken on the monochrome. The interesting thing with Antarctica when you're down there uh, in, in, in the season is that it's summer, so it's light 24 hours a day. And uh, as I got to, as I sort of say to people, it's 50 shades of white. So it's like pointing your camera at a white wall or a white piece of paper and trying to take a photograph of it. So essentially in Antarctica, there's ice and there's rock. So the area that, that you're in, there's no seawater, there's no whales, there's no penguins at Scott Base and McMurdo. Um, and so you're dealing with white and brown. And often full colour photographs can look black and white. This is actually a still shot. If you draw your eye out to the top right hand corner, you can see that uh, the camera is being held still. It's just the clouds flying over a very high point, um, a place called Castle Rock. But this is the sort of thing that you're often um, dealing with. And often the sky is white and the ground is white. So you can't really see um, what on earth is going on. This is a melt pool. The algae make it that colour. But when the blues are blue, they are completely and utterly extraordinary. So Antarctica is the coldest place in the world. It's the windiest place in the world. It's the driest place in the world. Where I took this photograph uh, in the dry valleys, this is the Howard Glacier. It hasn't rained for two million years. And when things die, they just mummify. There's, there's no moisture there. So there's, there's no flies, there's no lichen, there's no twigs. And the sky is so clear, but it's it's you've got to put suntan cream on at two o'clock in the morning. So you stick to a regimented schedule of meals. Um, you don't have to do anything to these photographs. Every morning I would go down to this little melt pool from the glacier. So it takes 50,000 years for the front of the glacier to appear. That melts. And that's what creates this little pool that was in front of our campground. So every morning I'd go down, probably the purest water in the world, and fill up the billy and boil it. And, um, and make a coffee, just extraordinary experience. This is uh, a Scott base to give you an idea of where it is. So this is the frozen Ross Sea with the melt pools in front of it. The little black sacks you might be able to see down there, those are seals. And so all of the adventure goes out from there. This is um, in an underground ice cave, the tip of the Erebus ice tongue. Um, and so as the ice is, for, it's not glacial, but it's forced down from Erebus which is, I think, one of five active volcanoes in the world, and it hits the frozen Ross Sea, creates um, pressure, and the pressure breaks apart the, the, the uh, ice, and then it snows. So you can't see it. It's completely solid. So if you fostic around, you can repel down into these. They are absolutely unworldly, completely freezing, the most and impossible to capture blue light. But because it's on the frozen Ross Sea, the base of the, um, the, base of the ice cave is frozen seawater and there are seals whizzing around and pinging below you so it's it's like being on the, the holodeck on um, on star trek it's quite extraordinary this is the ross sea meeting um ross island and these pressure ridges essentially are formed when the rock it's the ross sea is coming in like this and growing frozen and it pops up uh, in the most extraordinary shape no caves um, but extraordinary shapes are revealed it's actually looking across at Antarctica. So that landmass you can see there is Antarctica. This is um, Shackleton's hut. And he and his men spent a couple of years in here. And everything you may or may not have heard about these places is extraordinary. There are still socks hanging up. There's biscuits in the biscuit tin. There's cocoa in the cocoa tin. The dark room is over my left-hand shoulder here. Um, photography was important to the expeditions. They were all scientific-based and um, built in England, broken down into a ship and sailed and then, and then um, put together there. But it's literally like, um, it's literally like they just walked out. This work's called Shackleton's Legacy. We've sold a few of these. Um, they're $5,000 each and we give 100% of the money to um, charity. So we know, all, all of the money from the sale goes to, goes to other things. So this is, you can see this glistening stuff down, um, 
down the bottom left-hand side. That's whale blubber. So the stench inside these old huts is incredible. And the bars of soap, the candles, the biscuits, whole penguins still exist from 100 years ago to today. This is the hut at Discovery Point opposite um, McMurdo. It's the coldest, most bleakest and horrible place I've been in the world. This is a, this is a tragic story um, around this and I won't go into it, but the pot that you can see at the very front there, um, that has the remains of the last meal from the last men that were in there. And there was, um, they broke into this hut and on the left hand side you can see stacks of crates. Up until that point it was frozen solid uh, and what the men on this side of the hut did, who were starving to death didn't realise is that there was creme de menthe and chocolate biscuits and supplies um, more than what they needed uh, for a good party and for a long time frozen in, in a solid block of ice on the other side. It's so dry that when the snow blows there, it blows as powder and you know, fills, fills up um, cars if they're closed shut. I'm not sure if I explained that well. It's, it's so dry that when it snows, it's just like talcum powder. And then when it warms up slightly, it melts and then it, it refreezes. Um, so this is Canada Glacier, and this is also in the dry valleys. It's called Skyfall. This is at uh, Evan, Cape Evans, looking across at a glacier. So there we go. That's it. That was probably more images than anyone could possibly um, have. But so the most powerful thing in the world is um, you, essentially. And so that's the power of your idea and your photography. And um, yeah, thank you. Boom. Thanks very much, Jay. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> you want to uh, unshare your screen, and then we can uh, ask a few. There we go. Well done. Yeah. That's great. So look, <laughs> sorry for my disappearance earlier, everybody, um, but I'm back. The, um, an amazing number of images there, I think you'll, you'll agree. And I think that also shows that the versatility of Stu's vision, it's not just about one thing, it's about everything that wraps around it. So um, Stu, we're happy to answer a few questions from people. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's, uh, I'll start at the top and let me see, what have we got here? A few questions about some advice on how to get my camera started again. <laughs> um, let me see, okay, um, Ashley, uh, has been a long time follower apparently and uh, when you capture an image uh, do you take it knowing whether you're going to end up in black and white or color and, and if you shoot it in color do you then imagine how it would be in black and white yeah hi actually thank you for following uh, and the question so i do i tend to see things in black and white and square um, and so all of the early work, I was so excited when the Deluxe had square and the film grain option because I was just in happy land. So if, if an image is going to be black and white, I will shoot it in black and white. So I'm not afraid of taking portraits with the monochrome. Um, and if I want it to be colour, I will shoot on the S. But I have absolutely no problem in making a colour image um, black and white, you know, there are no rules. If it's going to, if there's a red umbrella in the background that's drawing your eye, I don't have a problem doing that. But the files that, the portraits that I get um, from the monochrome, uh, it's extraordinary. They just, they just, they sing and they dance. So if, I'm, if, I, if I want it to be black and white, that's the camera I'll shoot them on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, the, it's the only one for black and white, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Simon would like to know which of the countries that you've been to, and it's a considerable number by now, which country have you found the piece, people most amenable to be photographed? That's a really good question. Um, mm. It's not a question I've been asked for. I would say, so I would say um, it's relatively even. Um, I often put myself in a situation where I try and ask someone, I try and push myself to find someone who will say no, which generally means I'm going out there with someone who looks like they're unapproachable for whatever the reason is. Um, but I've, firstly, I say I'm Stu from New Zealand. I, you know, I, you know, so the New Zealand things helps. I'm sure the Australia thing helps, but you know, New Zealand, you know, the silver fern does have value, um, and that helps. And now I say I'm doing a global project. I'm photographing the single white rose in the hands of ten thousand people, and I would love for you to be one of those people. So, you know, from the, the first moment of rejection um, through to now, the, the patter, had, my story has um, evolved. It's elevated, and we don't get many no's. I, I had a, um, my guide in America, uh, not, uh, in India, 
um, he wouldn't take no for an answer. And we got into a bit of a hullabaloo up at a, at a border region with the military because I told him I'd like to photograph the white rose in the hands of the military. So that was his mission. Uh, yeah, it was... It was uh, and then he went from talking us into the situation to talking us out of the situation. So people are people are generally really good. You know, I have a little card that I take around with me so I can show people the sort of things. But um, yeah, I'd say in general people are pretty good. There's no standout country. All right. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, Nigel Lawrence would like to know in India. Um, did you have to pay or make a donation to your subjects? And if you did, would that change the way you approach the picture? So I, I, I don't pay for the portraits. I, if someone wants to be paid, I say that that's okay. Uh, and often in that situation, I will give them something and walk mm. away because it's often a, a very nominal amount of money. Mm. Um, but I, it does change how I feel about the portrait. Um, it's, there's an exchange going on. So if you go to your best friend's house for dinner and you put 20 bucks down and you go, that was good, thanks. And they're like, you know, it's, you know, part of it, it was worth at least 40. Why did I get 20? It just changed, it changed, it it muddies the water. Um, I've just come back from Cuba and there was a sense of, um, this is kind of what you've got to do. Uh, it was only one peso. Uh, uh, so I, I actually didn't feel that bad about it. And the, the outcomes that I was getting from the portraits didn't seem to be affected um, by, the, by the exchange. Mm-hmm. Did you ever, I just, this is me asking a question, um, when you do that exchange, do you think of it as a gift after you've taken the picture and, and created a relationship as opposed to payment beforehand for the picture? There's a sl- subtle difference there, I think. Yeah, well, and that's a great question, actually. So in India, so the woman with leprosy, I, I included that photograph. And um, there are some people that I photograph that I think there are easy shots, like homeless people and all this kind mm, of stuff. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm a bit sketchy about that kind of thing. They, they had their place in terms of um, content, if you're taking portraits of every sort of kind of person on the planet. Mm. Uh, but there are, there are people where I choose, once I've done it, uh, done the portrait, where I will actually either leave, uh, we call it a kohara in New Zealand, it's like a gift. Um, so I also, I don't want people to feel used and I don't want to use them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it is, it is a different situation. So often I'll have in one of my pockets a whole lot of pesos or a whole lot of whatever it is that's, right, that's okay. Because there are some people, you know, you, you do get, as I said in the, when I was talking earlier, you know, sometimes I'm not just looking through the eyepiece, the viewfinder, I'm looking through a tear through the viewfinder. And in those situations, if you feel you can make a difference, uh, then I think that you should. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Uh, Nigel. Um, oh, okay. We haven't, you, you haven't actually described your rose. Um, one, an anonymous attendee. And one of these days I'm going to find out who an anonymous attendee is. <laughs> um, yeah. Wants to know what, is it a real rose or not? Yeah. So, okay. so the only person that has held a real rose is Daryl Hannah. And she used the rose of her parents, uh, Rosebush in Malibu, and had actually made uh, a little miniature rose crown. Uh, but I carry with me a um, white silk rose, and um, you know, I, I spent you know, in, in, up in the north of India, in the Tar Desert, Rajasthan, these sorts of places. I was there for about a month, and I'm often in environments where there's absolutely no chance of getting a white rose. Mm. So in a little container, I take the silk rose with me. Um, But interestingly, the white rose has always been recorded as a symbol of peace everywhere in the world, in every country. So peace and pure love. So red is um, passion and love and yellow is friendship. And Persian women in the Ottoman Empire, so the Ottoman Empire ruled for 600 years, they um, they solidified communication with coloured flowers. So, you know, Valentine's Day is a, a red rose. You know, if you sent a, an orange rose to someone on Valentine's Day, they would just think you, you either didn't know what you're doing or you, the, the world would run out of red roses. So there are certain roses, you know, weddings, funerals, this kind of thing, colours that are chosen. Um, and so even in areas where there are no white roses, there seems to be this visceral understanding as a human what that symbol means so i wanted to choose a symbol that the dalai lama a murderer a mother a chaiwala anyone in the world would be happy to hold and not a judge as a symbol from a religion or a country or anything like that Mm, yeah okay yeah fantastic um, from, from a, a pro, prosaic answer to something a little more technical, um, do you have a particular focal length of lens that you t- 
tend to use more often than not for the for this for the, the peace project yeah so so what I, what, I, what I can say is that I just you know be, be a pirate be a Viking be a cowboy try things you haven't tried before zoom in on someone that's too close or too far away like just you just just go for gold and it's really through this experimentation and flow um, that really has got me into my happy place of kneeling in front of someone I use the I've got the 70 mil on the s mm. um, I love the 50 apo on um, any of the uh, range finders mm. um, and I I love that so I've got a, a Q2 that I kind of jam around with, and I absolutely love that camera. Um, I guess another favourite would be 35.14 Sumalux, I think. So mm -hmm. th there's a the, the, the poetry of the depth of field and the focal length when taking a portrait. Um, you know, so when I when I took the photograph of the the guy, the gang member with the tattoo like this, there was basically black circles I, I wanted him to be completely gone and then other times you just want Ricky Gervais to be slightly fuzzed out not not as sharp as the rose mm -hmm. so I just kind of play around with it there's, there's no there's no real fixed rules you know okay and it's I like the fixed focal length because you've got to move yourself you yeah. really you really put yourself into creating the art the image yeah. the photograph Yes, yeah. I, I noticed when you sent me some of the images we were discussing for this talk that a lot of the uh, the images were shot on a Q2. I, I looked at the metadata just to see what you were using. <laughs> of course you did. I don't even know how to find metadata. Oh, yeah, the other hand, <laughs> I was, uh, yeah. And yeah, I Q2, uh, I yeah, I know. I know you're, you're, you're a technical whiz, although you slightly bombed that at the beginning. But it's the only, it's the only <laughs> we can't call it a fail. We'll call it a pause. But the thing is, it's down again. <laughs> yeah. So the, the thing is, so I don't use Photoshop. I don't know how to open Photoshop. I kind of, if I'm in Lightroom, I do a bit of grading, like dodging, burning, contrast, that kind of thing. Um, I don't remove lamp posts, but why not remove lamp posts? I don't change skies. Why not change skies? You know, I don't. I don't. It's just because it's not my thing. I don't. I don't judge it, but I don't really muck around with the images too much. Really, they they come out how they come out. Basically, I try and shoot in camera. Well, fair enough. Um, now the next one, uh, Garrett would like to know. Um, that he, he said, I noticed a monopod in a few of the pictures that you show. Do you use that uh, quite a bit? And uh, is that really useful? Yeah, so the, um, the monopod is really useful. So when you are handballing your gear on your back and you're in a mm. hot environment and you're a little bit shaky, mm. um, if, if you look at, if you sort of zoom in on an image that's from a tripod, um, and sketchy like they were handheld, like that there is there is a level of sharpness there, and because it's a portrait, and you know the hands don't express the hands express us like no other part of our body, our humanity. And it's all the nicks and the, the you know the, all of that kind of stuff that's going on and fingerprints. And so I'm right in there focusing. So the monopod, if I'm having a solid day in a dusty village, and I'm on my and I'm standing up and down on my knees. So I crouch down, it's not right, it was stand up, move forward, crouch down, stand up, move back. Like you can get a bit sort of shaky. And the, I find the monopod fantastic. And there's a lot of different ones. Um, and because I'm, I don't need to get up sort of six foot high, you can get a solid lightweight monopod that's quite short. And I just leave it on the camera on my back strap and the, the monopod just hangs down my back. Okay. Uh, I missed the second half of the question. Is it not restrictive on the street? Uh, it's not. It's <laughs> it's not restrictive on the street. If you talk, if you speak to Nev, who you'll know, other people might not. He likes the idea of it, using it as a baton at times <laughs> <laughs> required. Uh, and there is the odd time where I've removed it from the camera and I've held on to the handle. Um, so I, it, it, there, there is a degree of security in terms of having a pivot point for your camera, leaning in, and leaning yeah, out. Yeah. So I do enjoy using one. Okay. All right. Good. Good. It's, it's, um, it's not. It's not going to be one. Sorry, one person's uh, admiring your taste in motor cars in your gallery. There's Spitfire there. All right. <laughs> um, in the Nigel Lawrence, in the picture of the burning aeroplane, uh, yeah. is that is the iPad there being used as a camera, or was it used as a monitor for the uh, the presentation? Yeah, no, it's been used as a monitor for the film camera that we were shooting on. Just so uh, I found myself being uh, essentially the director, um, telling a direct experienced director of photography what to do, and it just made it uh, it just made it easier. Essentially. Okay. Um, Richard Smith, uh, do you post images on Instagram? And if so, can you share your Instagram account name? 
Yeah. So the Instagram account name is Peace in Ten Thousand Hands. Ten thousand, the number. Mm-hmm. So one four zero is your piece in ten thousand hands. I think if you put piece in one, it comes up, but it needs to be not the word one, the number one. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, I, you'll notice actually if you go back through the timeline that I'm not very good at posting, and that I've made a commitment uh, to uh, post. That's part of the whole introverted nature of, of sharing outwardly. But I put a line in the sand that I'm now sharing. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I think you've you've sort of answered this one, but. St- um, Bettina Cutler would like to know, well, she says, I love the contrasty look of your Antarctica images, particularly the interior of the cabins. Do you do much post-processing or is this a combination of camera and lens? And what gear did you use to shoot those interior pictures? Yeah, so um, so when I was uh, 14, I had an interest in photography, but um, I've, I've, I haven't done a photographic course or I'm not trained. Um, my dad had a Pentax K1000 and the light meter was broken and you know, film was very expensive. Um, and I, I kind of just would play around with the settings. Um, I personally, I love manual, um, but I don't judge anyone that, you know, put, put it on A and just shoot all day. Don't think, just shoot, it's all good, right? And so when, um, in, it's interesting in the, the um, huts um, in Antarctica, because they generally will have one or two little windows, so there's a very direct source of light and the sun will move around. So depending on how long you were there, um, you, you kind of knew where the penguin sort of would be lit. Um, but I didn't, I, I don't really do any processing. There was a bit of contrast added to the, the Shackleton hut, which was the, the square on hut. Mm. And I used the S and I used a cell and I used um, the monochrome. Okay. And on the SL, I've got the little nifty, whoosh, so I can put the other, the M mount. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, here's a really good question. Why do you, this is from uh, Nicola C- Caspe, uh, Tim- Timothy Caspe, sorry. Why do you use Leica? Why do I use Leica? Good one, Timothy, thank you. Uh, well, the reason I use Leica, it's a really good question. I, you know, and, and the thing is that I, I was photographing a Leica and buying Leica. Um, I'm not a Leica plant. Um, and when I speak at photographic conferences and, and that kind of thing, you know, I'm all for, for choosing what, the, what tool feels best for you um, and when my, my grandfather had some beautiful watercolour brushes and I used those beautiful watercolour brushes and it's like when you have a pencil in your hand that just is kind of working or you have your favourite spatula or if you cut meat or vegetables in the kitchen there's a knife that uses you go to a knife and for me like it just feels part of me I, I, I can't I, I can't explain how viscerally I feel connected to a Leica camera and mm. It's intuitive and starting with the Deluxe, I never had to look at that camera when I wanted to change the settings and I kind of get what I want out of it. Um, and so, yeah, there's, for me, there's no option. I mean, that's just, that's just my choice. But it's, for me, it's, you know, it's, it's like her and I grew up with it with my grandfather and I think there's just something that sits viscerally within me. And I, I can tell you for sure that when you're kneeling down in front of an icon like uh, a Ringo Starr or you know, uh, uh, any of the people, you know, Melanie Griffith or anything like that, and you've got a big white lighter across the front of the camera, it, it, people have told me that it, it gives you more credibility. This uh, is true. Mm. Yeah, mm. and so that's it's, that's kind of another byproduct. There are many byproducts for me using lighter, and that's one of them, but, yeah. That's actually, nobody's actually said it like that before, but it's, it is true. There is a, a credibility somehow that comes yeah. when you, it's a branding thing, it's a recognisable brand, and yeah. that does connect some through somehow so you're right i don't think anyone's I, pointed that out i, I don't I, I won't mention any other camera brands but i was in a situation um, not so long ago where there were some other proper photographers and they had their you know their big uh cameras with their names on it and over my back i had the the s and i i bought it round on the front and there was this sort of shock wave of hush <laughs> in the room and um this you know that that professional doing the job i'm just doing what i'm doing but it, it, it does you know it can't it commands respect but it commands respect for a reason yeah, I, know. I know what you mean now i'm just going to take a minute here just to interrupt slightly because um i'm going to come back to a couple more questions before we finish but yeah. um from next week, which is our eighth webinar, uh, we're going to change it up a little bit. Um, we're going to do some different content and more importantly, different time of the week. So we've been 
trying to work out when is a good time. Now people are going back to work, maybe two o'clock on a Friday. Maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. So I can do a little poll thing here and I'm going to put this on the screen. And if you wouldn't mind, just click some times for me. Um, I've just got some choices there and I'd really, really appreciate people just, and you can click more than one, just what, what would suit you for June onwards in terms of webinars and lectures. Uh, we've got some photo tutorials that we're going to be doing, uh, other guests um, and so on. So just a little bit of feedback would be really good. And I'll just leave that on the screen for a few minutes. Um, oh, it's coming in really quickly. That's really great. That's uh, really cool. Can you see that, Stu? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Here we go. Can anyone else see that? Or is, can, can other people see that? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I'm not sure. No, okay. I just heard from the room you can't see it. So, oh, um, really? I've not used this know. before. It was a really good idea. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a new thing we found. I thought, what a good idea. Let's ask our regular people what actually they want. And it's up to 81% now. Uh, the most popular, ooh, is weekday evenings. That's interesting. Okay, well, we'll I'll just leave that for a few more minutes. So uh, whilst that's on the screen, I'm just going to continue with the last few questions, and then we will call it quits. Um, let me see. Oh, are you still using the Deluxe? <laughs> I, I am using the Deluxe. I've got to admit, though, um, I, there's just something about the Deluxe that just, like, you know, I, I also have to admit I have more than one. Um, but my, my go-to camera now is the Q2 and I kind of feel like it's a little bit like <laughs> anyone who has one kind of says that, um, but there is, there's just something magical about that. And it was, I had it on my shoulder for a period of time in Cuba and it was just, it's fantastic. It's great for the street cause it's discreet, but the files are insane. Mm -hmm. I can take portraits on it with people holding the rows. Uh, but yeah, I, I, to say I do use uh, I do. I, use. I, I think it's a camera that punches way above its weight. Um, I, I, I've used one myself. It does really good video too. But yeah, yeah. As, a, as, a, as a sort of take it anywhere camera. And I think it, it's just phenomenal. So I'm glad you said that. All right. I think that's about 91% of the vote. So I'm going to, I think if I click end, you may be. Oh, you can see it. Yeah. There we go. Okay, cool. I don't know if anybody else can. Anyway, no. Okay, so most popular time is weekday evenings followed by uh, sun, Saturday afternoons. So, or week, weekend afternoons. Okay. All righty. Um, I'm going to call that off. And that's just the last question. I think before we finish, um, where are we? Uh, I mentioned we've asked, answered that one. Um, Oh, just scrolling back, make sure we haven't a couple we've missed, but uh, another question about the deluxe. So oh, any, okay, last question is about the deluxe again. Um, is, is, are there any shortfalls about the deluxe? Maybe that's not a very good question to answer, to, uh, to finish on. I'll, I'll have a scroll through some more. Uh, well, actually, I, so, oh, well, while you're scrolling, I'll talk to that. So I, I went on a trip through Europe and it was just less than six weeks. I took 22,571 photographs on one Deluxe, I still have that Deluxe. And um, for me and for what I was doing and for what I wanted and the speed of the shutter in terms of if I was you know, trying to time a street shot or whatever, there's, I mean, obviously maybe you would pick on file size, but then I showed you the picture of the, of the large file that was created. So, you know, it, it, is, it is what it is. You know, you, you measure it against the, the category that it sits in. And I don't think in that category it's got any shortcomings at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would agree with that too, actually. Um, okay, the last um, the last question we'll finish on. Um, when this is from uh, Timothy uh, Casby again. Uh, when did you first develop your 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 deep love for photography? I mean, so um, I've always been very very visual. Um, I prefer looking rather than talking, and um, I kind of just soak the world up uh, as a as a child visually and that, that was that came through in um, drawing and painting and then uh, with a little bit of photography and then uh, essentially setting my career up around creating visual things and then when I was 40 I got to the point where you know I've never chased money it's not a motivating factor for me at all um, was creating something that had a legacy uh, in it that could 
help change the world, help empower people, raise money. And so the, the tool that I decided that I would use for that was photography, which excited me because I love photography. And um, to me, there's a great creative bandwidth in, in the photography. It's not just recording a moment. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at what you can do in post-production, lighting, angles, up, down, all this kind of, like, it's just phenomenal. It's, it's as freeing to me as having a paintbrush and a, and a blank uh, canvas uh, with any color that you could possibly imagine. And so at that point, um, I, I fell in love with photography on, on the trip with the Deluxe, basically, and decided that it needed to be everything about my future instead about making that, um, making that dream a reality. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, Stu, I think our time is up. Thank yeah. you so much. As a pleasure, as always. I love listening to you get passionate and go, you know, you, this is why we didn't interrupt the flow because you can see Stu is really in a space there and he's sharing his experiences with us and uh, it's, it's fantastic to listen to. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your energy with us. We really appreciate it. Um, yes, thank you, Stu. Man, thank you. All thank right. you. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And remember, it, it's don't think, just shoot. Don't worry about your focus. Don't worry about your exposure. Don't worry about your ISO. Don't worry about anything. You just start shooting. And, That's a, and it's magic, a good way. These magic yeah. moments will come. Now, I should also point out that Stu obviously goes through these pictures quite quickly. So the videos, these, these webinars are recorded. Uh, I usually can get them up on our YouTube channel um, within 24, 48 hours. So certainly by the end of the weekend, this, this will be up on the YouTube channel. So if you want to go through and dissect the images and freeze frame them so you can have a good look, please feel free. I'll put the link to the YouTube channel up in a sec when I say goodbye. So Stu, thank you very much. Thank I'll talk you. to you soon. And hopefully I'll see you in New Zealand very, very soon. Maybe next year. That'd be great. Let's take the van across the nervous again. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much for attending everybody. And until next week, goodbye.